get started. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for class six and our new member class. We just pray that you'd help us to uh, reflect on the things you want us to reflect on, uh, to, to teach truthfully the way that you run your church. And we pray as well, Lord, that we'd be encouraged by that, the way that you run your church. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so what we're doing today is the sixth class. And you might recall that all these classes kind of build on one another, right? We started with just the basics. What is the Bible? Then the gospel. And then specifically how the Reformed people view the gospel. That was the third one, predestination. And then uh, baptism, you know, who, who gets the sign of salvation? Then we had to talk about the LGBTQ issue. And now we're in class six, which is the final class, the second to last class. And this is uh, titled Sanctification or Sadism. Uh, why should I be a member? Um, and so those, those two words, sanctification or sadism, sanctification means, well, being a member will help sanctify you. But some people view it as like, why on earth would you want to be a member? Do you hate yourself? That's sadism, right? Like, I want to hurt myself. So uh, that's the, the class today. Why should I or why be a member of the church? What's the point? Uh, now that I've learned everything about the church, I've learned the doctrine in the first five classes. Why should I sign up and say, I believe with this stuff and now I want to be a member of the church? Uh, I'd like to introduce this class by sharing a story that Billy Graham shared. Uh, I heard him say this in a video. He said, I was on a plane one time. This is after Billy Graham got really famous. If you don't know who that is, he's a really famous evangelist. He'd pack out Angel Stadium and preach the gospel back in the 80s and things like that. And he said he was on a plane one time and there was a man on the plane who was just belligerently drunk. And he was harassing the stewardesses, the flight attendants, Um, He was making a scene, uh, just cursing and just being obnoxiously drunk. And so as this is going on, Billy Graham's kind of trying to mind his own business. And then one of the stewardesses recognized Billy Graham and said, hey, aren't you Billy Graham? He said, yes. And he said, well, we've got this very drunk man being obnoxious. Will you go do something about it? Thinking, well, you're a pastor. Maybe you can get him to stop being obnoxious. And so Bill Graham says, okay, sure, I'll try. So he gets up, he walks back into the, towards the back of the plane where this man is ranting and raving. And Billy Graham approaches the man and says, excuse me, sir, can I help you? And the man looks up at Billy Graham, very surprised, and says, hey, you're Billy Graham. And he says, I'm one of your converts. So this man, you know, being belligerently drunk, according to him, at one of the big crusades, went forward and gave his life to Christ. And, you know, the fruit of that was him being drunk on a plane. So I like how Billy Graham self-effacingly shares that story. But I share that story with this class, Why I Be a Member, because membership is integral to our sanctification. If we think Christianity is, well, I just pray some prayer and I say I'm a Christian and then I walk out the door and I'm not involved in a church, you're going to be that guy on the plane. That's kind of the point, right? You're not going to grow in your sanctification because there is no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. There are no Christians in the Bible who are just out here doing their own thing, right? The closest you get is John the Baptist, right? But he is still integrated in the church because he was one of the prophets. It's really interesting to look at John the Baptist. He's actually an Old Testament prophet and and a New Testament prophet. He's kind of both. So to be a Christian need to, means that we need to be a member of the church. A couple key verses to look at. Matthew 18 is one of them. Click at Matthew 18 to talk about why we should be members of a church. Why, why we can't just live in isolation, praying some prayer, and never going to church, being a member of a church. Uh, Matthew 18, starting in verse 12, says, What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I'd say to you, he rejoices over it more over the ninety-nine which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So the image that Christ gives here for his church is that the church is like a group of sheep. And this image would have really stuck with Jesus' hearers because, you know, it'd be like giving a cow analogy here 
50 years ago. This place used to be called Dairy Valley. There was dairies all over the place. Everybody knew you could smell cows everywhere you went. So you probably could smell cows in church. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Although the Dutch farmer said the smell of cows smells like money. Yeah. <laughs> I, t- I tend to disagree with that statement, but I think it smells like something much worse. But uh, they, they would, so, you know, if you gave a cow analogy back then, everybody would get it. That's what Jesus is doing with sheep. Everybody gets what he's talking about because they see herds of sheep everywhere. And what are herds of sheep doing? They're herding, right? What do you not see in a herd of sheep? You see a bunch of sheep together. You don't see one sheep running around doing his own thing. Now, if that happens on on rare occasion, what's the shepherd do? Well, he goes and he gets the sheep and says, get your butt back over here. You're going to get eaten by a wolf or you're going to get lost because you're not a very intelligent creature. And so that's the image that Christ gives of the church. He says, we're all sheep. They need to be bound together by the shepherd. We shouldn't be out running around doing our own thing. Another passage we can look at is Ephesians 4, verse 25. In Ephesians 4, 25, we read this. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak the truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We are members of one another. So Paul is saying here, to be a member of the church means that you are somehow united with the rest of the church. You're not your lone ranger doing your own thing, but you are a member of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so there's a lot we could say about that, but the the general thrust of what Paul's getting at there is that we are united together in some way. Not like being in a club, but more like being in a family. We are bound together by the blood of Christ. Okay, so when we look at passages like these and we plug them into Scripture, what do we see? We see that the Scriptures are written to groups of people right the the letters in the new testament like the one that we just read from ephesians is written to the saints who are in ephesus it's ephesians 1 verse 1 the the bible is written to groups of christians now there's letters like timothy and titus and philemon which are written to an individual but those are always in reference to the church the bible is written uh to timothy and titus and philemon telling them here's how you ought to conduct yourself in the church So the Bible is always written with this focus on the church, and the church is this group of people. And so when you look at individual passages like Matthew 18, Ephesians 4, look at the general thrust of Scripture, what we see is that the the general movement of Scripture is that this is a group of people. And so it should make no sense in our minds to think, well, I can be a Christian and not be a member of a church. That should be a foreign concept in our minds. That should be like a sheep wandering around by itself having a great life. That should be like the man on the plane who claims to be a Christian who's getting drunk, uh, harassing the flight attendants. It should not make any sense in our minds. If you look at Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Here, uh, God is charging the leaders of the church, and he's saying you need to pay careful attention to these church members, and not just some of them, but all the flock, and to care for the church of God. Why? Because he obtained this church with his own blood. So it's not only this picture that the Bible gives us of the church being united together, but it's also this picture of Christ dying for all the members of the body so that if one member is on a plane getting drunk yelling at the stewardess, the body of Christ, especially the leaders, but not just the leaders, the whole body, should look at that straying member and should care. And how is that going to happen if you're not a member of a church? So the, the point I'm trying to make is that church membership is kind of in the, the warp and the woof of the Bible. It's in the texture. It's in the fabric. It's in the DNA of the, the Bible. There's no Lone Ranger to, uh, uh, concepts in the Bible, but being integrated in a church family, it's, it's there. It's almost like it's on every page. 
Okay, so as we consider membership, really one of the first one of the first reasons we should be a member is because this membership is how we are um, preserved in the faith. This is how we're preserved in the faith. Now, if you remember our earlier lecture uh, on TULIP, the P in TULIP stands for preservation, perseverance of the saints, meaning if once you're saved, you're always saved. Now, what we're doing is we're answering the question, how is it the case that once you're saved, you're always saved? Well, here's how by being a member. Membership is the function, it's the mechanism by which God preserves his people. So if you see somebody who claims to be a Christian and they're not a member, you do well to question that person's faith. Now, that might be a temporary thing. They might become a member later, but if they if they perceive Christianity as like, well, I just prayed some prayer and I live my life however I want, I have no interest in being a member, um, it's, it's valid to, to question, at least in your own mind, I don't know if this person's genuinely saved. Why? Well, because Christ preserves his sheep by integrating them into the body of Christ. If this person's not in the body, I don't have high hopes that they're going to remain saved. Uh, they, what they might be doing is claiming to be saved without actually being saved. Uh, if, if a person's actually saved by Christ, that person's going to have a desire and a longing to be in the body of Christ. I was just having a conversation with a friend who says he's a Christian, but he's got no desire to be in the church. And I said, you know, Jesus is coming back not for Christians. Jesus is coming back for his church. And so if you say, I don't like the church, where are you going to be when Jesus comes back for the church? Well, you're going to be over here. Right. That's the that's the biblical presentation. That's why membership in the church is so important. OK. I have a really long quote here. I don't know if it's in your notes, if you still have those notes, um, a really long quote from a really great article. Um, and the title of this article is The Church, a Covenantal Community. And in this article, a man named Mark Herzer, it's like 30 pages of why we should care about church. And it's like filled with exegesis and, and tons of Bible passages. It's like this overwhelming argument showing people why you should not only be a member of the church, but also secondarily, why we should show up to church. Okay, so a corollary of us being preserved as members is that we will show up to church, right? It's not just having your name on the member rolls and never darkening the door of the church, but having your name on the member rolls and actually being a part of the church. So I want to read you this quote to answer the question, why do I need to show up? Why can't I just get my name on the member rolls? Why can't I just write them a check every now and then? Why do I have to be there with the, the people of the church? Or also another question, why can't I just watch it on the internet? Why can't I sit in my house and watch what they're doing from the comfort of my own living room? <clears throat> Long quote to buckle up, but it's, it's really good. The biblical commands and injunctions teach us that every believer must relate to one another visibly. In other words, all the injunctions in Scripture about loving one another, and he gives about 10 Bible passages. If you have your notes, you'll see there's 10 passages in parentheses where you can read those. Uh, being kind and compassionate, forgiving to one another. There's another verse, Ephesians 4. Speaking to one another, Ephesians 5. Submitting to one another, Ephesians 2. Bearing one another's burdens, Galatians 6. Agreeing with one another, 1 Corinthians 1. Serving one another in love, Galatians 5. Encouraging one another, 1 Thessalonians 5, Hebrews 3 and 10. Admonishing one another, Colossians 3. Accepting one another, Romans 15. Spurring one another on towards love and good deeds, Hebrews 10. Not slandering one another, James 4. Living in harmony with one another, 1 Peter 3. Offering hospitality to one another, 1 Peter 4, etc., all of these things that the Bible tells us to do cannot be fulfilled in any real measure if the professing believer is not visibly united to a local body of Christ. See, so he's just presenting this overwhelming wave of Scripture passages saying all this stuff that the Bible tells us to do can't be done 
if you don't show up to church and become a member of that church. The membership is how we're preserved and all the things that the Bible calls us to do happen when we show up to church. That's the point. If you'd like to read that article in its entirety, let me know. I can email it to you. It's really, really good. Okay, so this is God's paradigm for church. Why should I be a member? Well, it preserves you, and it's the way that you um, do the things the Bible's called you to do. Specifically, one of those things that the, Bi- the Bible's called us to do is sharing our gifts. Sharing our gifts. If you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 14, this is a, a key passage on uh, the sharing of gifts. And like Herzer just pointed out, you can't share your gifts if you're not physically there, right? Uh, you can't pray for people. You can't sweep the floors. You can't hand out the bulletin. You can't uh, worship. You can't let other people hear you sing. You can't do any, any of that stuff unless you're physically there. Now with technology, we can you know pick up the phone and call and pray, but um, there's still things that we can't do. Um, but in addition to that, look at 1 Corinthians 14.5. <clears throat> it says, Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may receive edifying. Okay, we could talk about prophecy in tongues, but that's not the point I'm trying to make, although that's integral to this text. But the point I'm trying to make is that he's taking two gifts— Prophecy in tongues, those are gifts that Paul lists in his list of gifts. Some people think that they don't exist. Some people think that they do exist today. That's not the point. The point is, here's these gifts that Paul is talking about. He says, these gifts are for are so that the church may receive edifying. So that the church may receive edifying. The point there is that God has given us all gifts. Part of Paul's point here is that we, we just listen, heard in the sermon in chapter 12, he says, hey, we're all part of the body. The hand can't tell the foot. I don't need you. We just heard that, right? We're all important. And since we're all important, we all have gifts. Paul says we all have gifts. And those gifts are not to have, help us to have better lives alone while we're doing our thing. But those gifts are for the edification of the church. Why do I need to show up? Well, because you've been given a gift that God wants to use to edify your brothers and sisters in Christ. And you can't do that on the internet, or at least very well. Okay, so look again, same, same uh, chapter, verse 12. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Seek to abound for the edification of the church. Desire a gift so that you can serve the church. Look at verse 19. However, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. Right? He's saying tongues, that's, that's great, but I'd rather speak something that you can actually understand. Why? Because that's edifying to you. I want you to hear something that's going to strengthen your faith, that's going to give you joy, that's going to point you to Christ. <clears throat> Verse 26, what is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all these things be done for edification. Again, edification. That word edification that you hear him repeating over and over again, similar to our word edifice, right? It's, it's something that's used to build something else. Um, it's in, in the Greek, the term is uh, related to a construction term. It means all these things are for the building up. You've been given this gift for what? To build up the church. Not necessarily physically build the church, but to spiritually build up the church. So think about it this way. Give a real practical example. Somebody's having a really hard time. Let's say there's a, there's a member of the church who's thinking about giving up their faith. And they're like, you know what? I can't believe God allowed me to go through this hard time. I'm done. I'm, I'm throwing in the towel. And they, they make up their mind that in church on Sunday, they say, this is the last time I'm ever coming back to church. I'm giving up on my faith. And then you see them after church and you give them a big hug and you say, I'm so, gr- I'm so glad to see you today. Um, you know, I just, I'm glad to see you. I like you a lot. I love you in Christ. And then because of those words that you spoke to that person, they sense the love of God and they say, actually, God does love me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep persevering in the faith. What's happening there? You have this gift of encouragement. You're just being nice. You just say, I love you. And God has used you to help that person persevere in the faith. 
it's not like you need to go up and preach a sermon or be some, some genius theologian, right? It's just you've been given this gift of encouragement, this ability to communicate with someone, and God uses that for the building up. You've, you've built up that person's faith. <clears throat> Another key text to look at is Hebrews 25 or excuse me, Hebrews 10, 25. Hebrews 10, 25 is a key verse for showing up to church. It says, Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. All right, so he's saying in 1025, don't forsake the gathering together. Some people aren't gathering together, but don't do that. Instead, gather together. Why? So that you can encourage one another. Why? Well, because the Lord is returning, and we need to encourage each other to look forward to the return of Christ. So the point here is that when you come to church, if you don't want to, Part of the problem is that you have a low view of what you're doing at church. Now, this is hard if you're one of 5,000 people in a big auditorium, right? But, so that's not our situation, so I'm not going to speak to that. But when you're in a smaller church of 140, 120, this is a lot easier. Because when you show up, people notice. When you're gone, people notice, right? Everybody at this church knows what that's like, because when you don't show up, what happens? People start calling you. Hey, where you been? Just making sure you're okay, right? And that's a good thing. So what does that mean? Well, it means when you're gone, people notice. Well, what does that mean? Well, when you're here, you're clearly making an impact. So if you think, well, there's no point in me showing up to church, what you need to understand is that what you're doing at church is significant. Biblically speaking, what you're doing at church is edifying those around you. You are part of the hands and feet of Jesus, which are building up your brothers and sisters in Christ. It may be as simple as shaking somebody's hand and saying, glad to see you. Uh, But one thing that's extremely important that we fail to forget, practically speaking, is in worshiping. You know how depressing it is to stand in an auditorium and be the only person singing to Jesus? You know how beautiful it is to be in a packed auditorium hearing hundreds of voices singing to Jesus? You see, you see the difference between those two things? Well, if you don't show up and nobody else does, we're not going to be encouraged in the singing of the praises of God. But if we all show up and we all sing, well, it's going to encourage everybody. And you're part of that. Your voice is part of that covenantal community encouraging one another. Okay, so... Why be a member of the church? First reason, this is how we're preserved. This is how we're preserved in the faith. A corollary of that is obviously, well, you've got to actually physically be there, not just put your name on the rolls, but be there as often as possible. Second reason why we should be uh, members of the church is that we all need leadership. We all need to be led by other people. This is, we're going to look at some passages that show this. Why is there no sheep just running around doing his own thing? Well, part of it is because he might get eaten by a wolf. But the other part of it is that that sheep needs to be led to green pastures. That sheep needs to be taught where to go. It needs to have a shepherd guiding it along, not just so it doesn't get eaten by a wolf, but so that it can find green pastures to feed on and to thrive. We all need leadership. And you're not going to get leadership if you're not a member, if you don't show up, you're not going to get it on the internet. If you're listening to someone talk to you who has no idea you exist, that person's not truly leading you. Leadership comes through relationship. Let's look at the verses. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. If we look at 1 Thessalonians 5, we can... Um, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, we can see a instruction to obey leaders and for leaders. 1 Thessalonians 5, starting at verse 12. But we, re- we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Now, this is Paul instructing the Thessalonians how to relate to their leaders 
But that's not the point I want to draw out of this. This this subsidiary point, the secondary point here, is that Paul is assuming that the Thessalonians have leaders, right? If if he's telling them, hey, here's how I want you to relate to your leaders, what's the assumption there? They've got leaders. He's writing to the Thessalonian church, and part of his instruction to the church has to do with the leadership in the church. He's assuming that there's leaders. Uh, Look at 1 Peter 5.5. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Again, Paul is instructing, or Peter is instructing uh, the church. He's saying, hey, you've got elders, and the young ones, the non-elders, need to submit themselves to the elders. He's saying, there's leaders in the church, and follow your leaders. So that's his primary point. But again, a secondary point here that I want to draw out is that this type of leadership, a corollary of this, is that it's called, it's servant leadership. So why should I be a member of a church? Well, part of it's because you need leadership. But as we talk about leadership, we need to specify what kind of leadership it is. It is not Typical worldly leadership. Jesus says, Do not be like the Gentiles, for the Gentiles lord it over their subjects, but it should not be so among you. The first will be last, and the last will be first. Leadership in the church is done through uh, imaging Christ. How does Christ lead the church? I like to talk about it all the time. He got on his his, his hands and knees and washed the disciples' feet, and then he died for them. That's his leadership. And so we need leadership You need to be a member for leadership, but the leadership of the church should not be, hey, I'm the guy in charge, listen to me, I'm going to tell you what to do, I'm important, you're not important. Rather, it should be servant leadership, which says, I'm a sinner in Christ, I'm uh, completely worthy of God's wrath and condemnation, but by his grace, I've been saved, and because of nothing to do with me, and only because of his grace, he's called me to be a leader in this church, and now all I want to do is help you grow in that grace. I don't want to use you for my benefit, but I want to benefit you by leading you to places where you'll grow. And you can't experience that servant leadership, which is the elders of the church. You can't experience that without being a member. If you're just watching online, as soon as the the leader says something you don't like, you can just turn it off. You don't have to listen. There's no relationship there. You can have... You can have a stack of pornography this tall sitting right next to your computer watching the pastor preach and there's a stack of pornography there. But if you're a member of the church and you start building relationships, soon your friends and the elders are going to know your life and then if we come over and see a stack of pornography, we're going to say, hey, we need to talk. You're going to be led away from that destructive habit towards a habit that is good for you. That's why we need leadership. Okay, so as we're thinking about leadership, there's an objection. Well, my leader uh, isn't very good. Uh, What about bad leaders? What about, um, I'm I'm not talking about leaders who are absolutely sinning and need to be fired, right? That, That happens. Uh, but I'm talking about, you know, this guy's just not very good. He's not very smart. Um, he's kind of like the pastor of Artesia First. You know, he tries his best. But <laughs> he tries his best, but it, he tries his best, but it's just not really kind of cutting it. It's not cutting the mustard, right? What about bad leaders? So why, why do I need to go to a church in person when I know more than the leaders? Well, look at this. This is amazing. This is really amazing. Look at Luke 4.16. In answer to that objection, Luke 4.16. So this is, this is speaking about Jesus. It says, He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. Now what is that saying? to the objection this leader is not very good. Jesus, as was his custom, 
went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Now, if anybody could say, I know more than these guys, it'd be Jesus. But what was his custom? To show up to church. Jesus went to the synagogue, as was his custom on the Sabbath. The creator of all things, the very word himself, went and heard these fumbling, bumbling rabbis spew out his own words in ways that were shameful compared to Christ speaking them himself. But he went anyways, as was his custom. Well, why does Christ do that? Why is, it, uh, why is Christ doing that? Well, he's a servant leader. Christ is leading us. He's showing us, this is what I want you to do. Notice that this goes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. In Genesis, the creation account ends on the seventh day. What's the seventh day? It's a Sabbath. The Lord rests, right? The Lord, before, while he's creating the world and the Lord in his incarnation is imaging, here's what I want you to do. Take one day out of the week and dedicate it to the Lord. Show up to church, right? Christ demonstrates that. He shows us how important that is. And so these objections, well, I can be a member without showing up, or I, I don't want to go to this church because the leadership's not good enough. All of these objections, when we take those objections to the text of Scripture, we realize, well, those, aren't, those don't hold any water. Right? If, if we were to stand before God and God were to ask us, well, why didn't you become a member of a church like I told you to? We wouldn't be able to say any of these things because he could say, well, I, I was a member of a church. Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and I built it into the creation ordinance. There's Sunday, the day of the sun, the Lord's day. It's part of your week. So there are no uh, reasons to avoid it. Okay, now lastly, actually this this is kind of like 2A. This is still kind of a corollary of leadership, is discipline. I'm running out of space here. Discipline, okay? I already kind of alluded to this with the analogy of the stack of pornography. Um, Another reason we need to show up to church and be members is because part of the leadership is not just let me show you, um, let me try to lead you to greener grass so you can grow, but part of the leadership is also discipline. It's also, hey, you know, you're... You're, you're straying away from the teaching here, and we need to kind of rein you back in. That's part of what we all need as leaders, okay? I talked about in an earlier class, this is, this is part of the reason why we're Presbyterian in government. Presbyterian comes from the Greek word presbyteros. Presbyteros is the Greek word for elder. It just means we're elder-led. We're led by elders. Uh, we are not... Um, papists. We don't believe in one guy. There's not one pope who's in charge. It's a group. It's always a group of people. So I am basically just an elder, and there's six other elders. We are all under each other's discipline, right? I am not the guy in charge. They're not in charge. It's a group of people. Why? Because we all require discipline. We all need somebody looking into our lives who is willing to to step up if, if we need to hear it and say, hey, there's something destructive going on in your life here. You're straying from the fold, and, and I'd like to help you. We all need that. And that's another reason why we need to show up to the church. We all need uh, discipline. Um, really good article on this is Belgic Confession 32. Article 32. I'm going to read part of it for you. This is page 110 if you have your gray book. But this is the order and discipline of the church. We also believe that although it's useful and good for those who govern the churches to establish and set up a certain order among themselves for maintaining the body of the church, they ought always to guard against deviating from what Christ, Christ, our only master, has ordained for us. Who's the one master of the church? Not the pastor, not the elder, Christ. Therefore, we reject all human innovations and laws imposed upon us in our worship of God, which bind and force our consciences in any way. So we we are looking to Christ for the discipline and leadership of the church. If somebody comes up with a good idea and says, hey, we're going to start worshiping on Mondays now because that works better with uh, my work schedule. We're like, nope, sorry, it's Sunday in the Bible. We're not doing that. It's not the inventions of man. It's what Christ has taught us in his word. So we only accept... So we accept only what is proper to maintain harmony and unity and to keep all in obedience to God. So the goal here of discipline is harmony, unity, so that all people are obeying not the pastor, not the elders, but God. That's the goal of discipline. A harmonious, unified church where everybody obeys God. Wouldn't it be beautiful 
if all of our churches completely obeyed God and nobody fought and nobody bickered and, you know, everybody just loved everybody and served God. Now imagine if that's what the church was like. Well, how does the church get there? Discipline. It's through, through discipline. So finally, they say in the end of the article here, to that end, excommunication with all it involves, according to the word of God, is required. So, the last reason, this is counterintuitive, the last reason why we should be members of the church is so that we can be excommunicated. I know this sounds really contradictory. Why should I be a member of the church? Well, so that you can potentially not be a member of the church. Right? That's, that's the rationale here. Uh, and why, why is that important? Well, it's important because you know, when, um, when Jesus talks to Peter and he says, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom, Roman Catholics think, oh, that's the Pope. But Presbyterians think, no, that's the elders. And so when, you, when he says, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven, what you loose on earth is loosed in heaven or on earth, um, what we believe Christ is saying there is the elders are charged with determining to the best of their sinful ability, we're not going to do this perfectly, but part of our goal that we're going to try to do is say, here's who's in the church and here's who's out of the church. And so people should, their relationship with the church should be, yes, I believe I'm saved because of my faith in Christ, but part of my assurance comes from my leaders who also say, we affirm that in you. The leadership is saying, yes, you're a member of the church. So it's not like we can't have that assurance without the leaders, but part of the leader's job is that. So that, if that's the way you're getting your assurance, right, you never want to just rely 100% on yourself. If you think you're saved, but nobody else thinks you're saved, you should probably question your salvation, right? Don't rely 100% on yourself. That's why we need excommunication. So if that's the approach we have, and then I'm living in sin, and I'm saying, I'm not going to stop my sin. And the elders say, this, could, this sin could drag him to hell. What are the elders going to do? We're going to say, brother, after a year or two or three of counseling with you, you with this, and we've determined you are just not giving this thing up, we are going to excommunicate you to try to prove to you that in our estimation, you are not saved. With the goal being, like Paul says, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 5, Purge the leaven from your midst, purge the evildoer from your midst, so that Satan might sift him and he might be brought back into fellowship. So the goal is excommunicate, saying, we don't think you're saved, so that that person will say, hey, I think I'm saved, but the whole church is saying I'm not. Maybe I need to consider my life. Then they consider their lives and they say, I really am in sin. And then they repent and they come back to the church and they're now right with God. So do you see how the goal of excommunication, according to the Bible, is to prevent the sheep from straying and getting eaten by a wolf? That's the goal of it. It's, it's, to, it's the smelling salt. It's supposed to wake us up um, and prevent the sheep from being devoured. Okay, so those are the reasons why we should be members of the church. Okay, I want to end on um, two points to make. Uh, as you're considering membership of this church, First thing I want you to know is that I have presented to you the church in an ideal form. I've presented to you the theory of the church. I haven't presented to you the reality of the church. The reality is you're going to have bad leaders who aren't just like not that smart, but that sin. Reality is we're not going to excommunicate the people that we should. And we're going to maybe even discipline people who shouldn't be disciplined. The reality is a bunch of people aren't going to show up to church. The reality is uh, we're not going to be harmonious and unified all the time. Sometimes you'll show up and someone's going to, one of your friends is going to yell at you or something bad like that. The reality of the church is that though this is the way it should look, often we are injured by the church because the church is filled with sinful people. And so the Bible's paradigm is follow Christ and nobody's going to get hurt. But the reality is people in the church don't always follow Christ. And sometimes people do get hurt. And so as you're considering membership in the church, we want to manage expectations, right? The picture we've presented is heaven on earth. Because when the church functions as it should, it really is heaven on earth. Everybody's harmonious. Everybody obeys God. Everybody worships together. Everybody sacrificially loves one another. It's heaven on earth. 
But the reality is, is that that's not necessarily going to be the case. And so we need to walk into church having our expectation managed, knowing I know what I want church to be, but in reality, there might be some people in here who are members or elders or deacons or pastor who aren't acting the way that they should. The solution to that problem, discipline. If it's bad enough, you talk to, the, you talk to a friend or you talk to an elder or you talk to me, an elder, and you say, hey, there's, there's this situation going on. We might need to bring in some discipline, right? But we need to understand that, that the reason discipline's a, a re- reason for us to join the church is because sin happens in the church. That's the first thing. The second thing and the last thing is, well, let me say one more thing on that, sorry. Uh, when the church lets us down, I think the reason for that, the reason why God sovereignly has allowed the church to fail in this way is because when we are members of a church that fails, we are forced, or at least given the opportunity, to love like Christ loves. Who does Christ love but the most wretched sinners in the world who are killing him? He's praying for them as they nail him to the tree. So when you become a member, now all of a sudden you've got the same opportunity. This person's not treating you the way that you should, but you have the opportunity to love them even though they're not treating you the way that they should. I think that's why God allows the church to not be perfect this side of heaven, and heaven is going to be perfect. Okay, last thing. When we do all this, when we submit to this, when we become members and show up and submit to discipline and love one another, when we do that properly through the power of the Spirit, that is when we will experience belonging to a degree that is impossible in any other way. No matter how great your company is that you're a part of, no matter how great your big your family is, when you're a part of the body of Christ, that need to belong to something greater than yourself is satisfied in a way that nothing else can satisfy it. Being part of the eternal bride of Christ and doing things for his glory, that's purpose. Your job, not as important. Your blood and flesh family, not as important. This is the ultimate calling to be a member of the Church of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for membership of the church. We pray that you would um, bring your sheep into the fold. We pray that you would protect your sheep through your sovereign hand. And we pray that you would continue to cleanse your church so that we might glorify you and ultimately be presented to you blameless and in glory. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.